So is throwing someone into a black hole a great method of revenge? I mean, it'd be pretty bad, but you never actually see what happened to them, so I guess not. Hi, I'm Mike Siegel. I'm an astrophysicist. I write for Ordinary Times, and this is The Throughput. So last week saw the conclusion of the TV series Loki from the MCU. Uh, I was a big fan of the series and uh, it quite enjoyed it. Um, but there's not a lot of science in it because Loki is, like a lot of the MCU, dealing more in fantasy and so forth. And especially Loki, which has the idea that magic is real and things like that. There's time travel, parallel universes, paradoxes, all that kind of thing. You could go crazy trying to analyze that scientifically. But there were two areas where Loki sort of ventured into science that I thought were kind of interesting. In the first season and in the second season, a lot of the action eventually centers around the end of time with one man remaining who is sort of looking over the entire multiversal cosmos. Is there such a thing as the end of time? Well, we don't really know. There are three ways that the universe can end. And if maybe 30 years ago, we had a pretty good idea of how that would go, but uh, things changed dramatically in the late 90s. Now, in a previous video, I talked about the expansion of the universe, and I used my little model universe here, where the elastic is the fabric of space-time and the little pins are galaxies to show how the universe expands and the galaxies move away from each other. This example is a bit limited because you can see it's expanding into my library, but in reality, the universe is just expanding into itself. It's just growing, not expanding into anything. But I always like this demonstration because you can see the little galaxies move apart, and that explains the Hubble flow, the Hubble expansion, how when we look at distant galaxies, we see they are moving apart from us, not because they're actually literally flying away from us, but because the space between us is expanding. Now, what will happen to the universe depends on what happens to that expansion. If the expansion were to slow down and then reverse, the universe would shrink. And this is what, and eventually go back to being a singularity, they go back to the Big Bang. This is what we call the Big Crunch. Now, in order for this to happen, the mass of the objects within the universe would have to have more gravitational force than the initial expansion caused by the Big Bang. And they would have to then slow it down, cause it to reverse, and crunch back. And in some versions of that, time would actually run backwards. We don't think this is going to happen. There doesn't appear to be enough mass in the universe for this to happen, but that is one possibility for what would happen at the end of time. Another possibility uh, is that the universe would just go on to infinite expansion. It would expand and slow down as gravity slowed it down, but never really stop and just go on to this infinite expansion. Now, we thought those were the two possibilities, but in the late 90s, things changed. What we were doing was, you know, we see the universe expanding around us, but we thought that in the past, the universe must have been expanding much more rapidly, that the universe expands very fast, gravity slows it down, and it eventually decelerates. And what we were trying to do was to measure that deceleration to see how fast the universe was slowing down so we could get another estimate of how much mass there was in the universe and ultimately the fate of the universe. Is the universe slowing down enough that will eventually stop and contract or is it going to infinitely expand? So what we did was we looked at the most distant supernovae, which are standard candles. We looked at these very distant stellar explosions because when we look at those really distant stellar explosions, we are seeing the past. It took hundreds of millions of years for that light to reach us, and therefore we can see how fast the universe was expanding a few hundred million years ago. And what we expected to see was that the universe was expanding much more rapidly in the past. To our surprise, we found it was expanding much more slowly in the past. That is, the universe isn't slowing down because of gravity. It's rapidly expanding faster and faster because of something else. Now, it's something else you may have heard about is called dark energy. It's not a concept we really have a good handle on, and I especially don't have a good handle on it because I'm not a theoretical cosmologist. But this, it turns out to be the dominant force in the universe, and the fate of the universe is going to depend on what the nature of dark energy is and what dark energy decides to do over the next few tens of billions of years. If dark energy continues to accelerate the expansion of the universe, then what you have is what is called the big rip. Right now, the expansion of the universe pulls galaxies away from each other. That's why when we look at distant galaxies, we see them moving away from each other. But it's not pulling galaxies apart because the gravity binding galaxies together is stronger than the Hubble flow. It doesn't pull you apart because the electromagnetic forces binding your body are 
stronger than the Hubble flow. So if you find yourself getting bigger in time, it's not because of Hubble. Eventually, if the Hubble flow continues to accelerate and accelerate, that expansion gets stronger and stronger. It's going to start pulling apart galaxies. It's going to start pulling apart solar systems. It's going to pull apart planets. It'll pull apart people. It will pull apart particles. It will eventually pull apart the universe itself. And the universe will end in this uh, gigantic rip of when space-time itself is fragmented. The end of the universe is kind of a dark subject, so uh, be warned. Now, dark energy, we don't really understand it, so we don't know what it's going to do as the universe expands. There are versions of it where different things happen. What Loki has is this infinite expansion, what we thought was the eventual fate of the universe up until 30 years ago, that the universe expands and expands and expands. What happens, though, is that you start is that you have what Bertrand Russell called the heat death of the universe. You start running out of useful energy. All the hydrogen is burned up in stars. All the matter starts coalescing into black holes. The universe gradually goes cold and dark. Eventually, those black holes begin to evaporate from what we call Hawking radiation. And the universe ends as this, this cold, infinitesimally dense sea of fundamental particles. Whereas the universe started as a point of infinite density in the Big Bang, now it has infinitesimal density and infinite size. And so Loki seems to be in that, where you have the dead universe. You have, you know, all the history has happened. All the stars have died. You just have this cold, dark universe that's left over and one little citadel where he who remains can look over the universe. So probably not going to work out that way. Uh, you know, I will have an episode on time travel at some point at some point, but that is the cosmology that uh, Loki is embracing. Now, the other thing that caught my attention in Loki was when they mentioned spaghettification. Uh, for an astronomer, spaghettification twinges our antennae, so we're like, ooh, spaghettification, I like that. It turned out in the series, spaghettification was something totally different. It was where time radiation caused people to fragment into pieces and so forth, um, and that was interesting and horrifying and uh, tragic, but that's not what we usually mean by spaghettification. In astronomy, what spaghettification means is very specific. When you have two objects close to each other and they're exerting gravitational force on each other, let's take the Earth and the Moon, the force of gravity on the side nearest the Moon is stronger than the force of gravity on the center of the Earth and is stronger than the force of gravity on the side furthest from the Moon. And what this does is it creates what we call a tidal force, a sort of stretching force where this side of the Earth is being pulled towards the moon. This side of the Earth is moving away from it because it has less gravity in the center of the Earth. And that tends to stretch it out. Now, the Earth doesn't actually stretch out because the Earth is very solid and bound by uh, very strong gravity. But this liquid that sloshes around on the surface, the oceans, that does move around. On the side nearest the moon, the water moves towards it. On the far side away, it moves away from it, and that's what creates tides. It's a little more complicated than that, but generally when the moon is overhead, that's when you get high tide, and when the moon is on the horizon, that's when you get low tide because the water's sloshing towards the other side of the Earth. But tidal forces exist anywhere in the universe. Anytime you have two objects interacting gravitationally, tidal forces exist. And when we talk about spaghettification, what we mean is if you were falling into a black hole feet first, the tidal forces of black holes are incredibly strong. And the gravitational force on your feet might be way stronger than the gravitational force on your head. And as a result, you would get stretched out into a long piece of spaghetti and, uh, and then go swirling into the black hole. So that's what astronomers mean by spaghettification. Now, a few things to say about spaghettification when we talk about it this way. One, spaghettification is absolutely real. Uh, we've never seen a person fall into a black hole, not yet, but we have seen stars fall into black holes. I work with the SWIFT mission. We study gamma ray bursts. One of the things we, our spacecraft does is it scans the sky looking for flashes of gamma rays. Uh, in 2011, we had this bright flash of gamma rays. We thought it was a gamma ray burst, and we got on our computers, we analyzed data, we sent out the circular, but over the next couple of days, it kept exploding, and gamma ray bursts don't do that. You have one big explosion where you're creating a black hole, either from a supernova or from neutron stars crashing into each other. And I talked about this in my you know, Week in the Life video. But generally, you have one big explosion and you might have little flares, but you won't get it to just get way brighter, whereas this kept getting brighter and brighter and brighter. And what we eventually figured out was that this was in a distant galaxy. A star came too close to a black hole 
and was spaghettified, was torn apart by the black hole. And as that material settled onto the accretion disk around the black hole, that disk of material swirling into the black hole, it gave off enormous amounts of radiation and light. And that was what we detected. And since then, we've seen a lot of these tidal disruption events. So these do happen. Stars wander too close to, to black holes and get torn apart. And we can see this billions of light years away. Now, one of the other subtleties about spaghettification, though, is that stars disrupt much easier than people. That sounds counterintuitive. The star is a big, huge thing. Why would it uh, disrupt much more easily than a person would? Well, first of all, a star is really huge. So the tidal force across the star is much bigger than the tidal force across your body. But also, the star is bound together by gravity. You are bound together by electromagnetic forces. And electromagnetic forces are way more powerful than gravity. This is why when you get on a pull-up bar, the Earth's gravity doesn't yank your feet off of your body because the electromagnetic forces holding your feet onto your body are way stronger than gravity, even though the Earth is really huge. It's easier for a person to get near to a black hole than it is for a star. The star is going to be disrupted fairly far out, whereas depending on the size of the black hole, you could get really, relatively close. I bring this up because eventually I'm going to talk about the movie Interstellar. And one of the things people asked me was, there's at the climax of the movie, Coop goes into the black hole. And people said, well, wouldn't he be spaghettified? Wouldn't he be torn apart? Not necessarily. I have in my library, The Science of Interstellar by Kip Thorne, where he goes into the uh, astrophysics, astrophysical specifics of uh, what they did for the movie. And the black hole in that called Gargantua is really huge. It's a super massive black hole. And that actually makes things easier because although the event horizon of a black hole that size is really huge, maybe out to the orbit of Jupiter or out to the orbit of Uranus, um, the gravitational field that far out is relatively gentle. Once you get close to the singularity, it gets way, the way strong. But when you're further out, the uh, gravitational field and the tidal field is much more gentle. He also explains that the uh, black hole in that movie is a rotating black hole. This causes a thing called frame dragging, which I don't really understand, but actually does reduce the tidal stresses on objects that fall into them. But even without that, I ran the numbers here. If you say Gargantua is a billion solar mass black hole, the event horizon, that is where light can no longer escape, would be at about the orbit of Uranus, 19 astronomical units out from the center of the black hole. And at that distance, the tidal force on a human body would be about a thousand newtons. That is going to be very uncomfortable. It's certainly enough to like tear apart his spaceship and so forth, but it wouldn't be enough to tear apart your body. You don't want to Google how much force you need to tear apart a body. You'll run into some really disturbing things, but it does seem it would be a few kilonewtons that you would need to disrupt a human body. And thousand newtons, that's about twice the gravity you would, the force you would feel if you were hanging from a pull-up bar, and that's probably not gonna, gonna kill you that way. So uh, that is relatively accurate. So it is one of the paradoxes of the spaghettification process that you as a human are a little more robust than a massive star or a planet or something like that, just because of the strength of the forces binding your body together. Now, when you're talking about Loki, and this magic spaghettification from timey-wimey, wibbly-wobbly stuff, I, I have nothing to say to you. I can't help you with that. I did enjoy the series quite a bit. Uh, I enjoy fantasy a lot, and this was very much a fantasy series. I thought the cast was great, uh, especially the chemistry between Hiddleston and Wilson. I thought it was fantastic. The ending was kind of bitter sweet, but uh, overall, I think that was just one of the... The Marvel series have been kind of hit or miss for me, and this was definitely a hit. But uh, I did think, think that was very interesting to see the end of time, the way they portrayed it. And uh, although spaghettification wasn't what scientists imagine when we talk about spaghettification, it was pretty horrifying. So uh, I have another video I'm preparing for you, one you've been asking for for a while. Uh, until then, I'm Mike Siegel. I write for Ordinary Times. Thank you for watching.